The particle P moves on the x-axis. At time t seconds, the velocity of P is v, in the direction of x increasing, where v is given by what we have over here. So there's two parts of this function. We have when t is between 0 and 4, and we have when t is greater than 4. When t is equal to 0, p is at the origin, and then we're trying to find the greatest speed of p in the interval of 0 to 4 seconds, meaning this part of the function here. So we're just considering that part. What we have here is a quadratic. The coefficient for t squared is negative, and therefore the shape of the graph would be like this. So let's think of what that graph looks like. So let's factorize to begin with. We can take out what t is. We can take out t, rather. So this becomes t times 8 minus 3 over 2t. Set this equal to 0 to find out what the roots are. And we get t is 0, and 8 minus 3 over 2t is 0. This gives t is equal to 16 over 3. And that's the same thing as 5 and a third. So after about 5.3 seconds, that's when the velocity will be 0 again. Let's sketch out our graph. So let's plot velocity against time. So we know we have one root when t is equal to 0, and we have one root when t is equal to 5 thirds. But we're only sketching between 0 and 4 seconds. So our graph would then look something like this, where this value here is 4 seconds, this is 0. And if you were to continue this on, then this point would be 5 and a third, so 5.3 recurring seconds. But again, we're only considering between 0 and 4. We're trying to work out the greatest speed in that interval. So we can see from our graph the greatest speed would be at this point right here. This is a quadratic so it's a symmetrical shape. What that means is, directly in between t is equal to 0, or halfway in between t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 5 and 3rd, that will be where we have our turning point. So this point is halfway between 0 and 5 thirds. Well, halfway between these two is just half of 5 thirds, or half of 16 over 3, which is 5 thirds, and that's 8 over 3, so this coordinate here the t value is 8 over 3. We can then work out what v is by putting in t is 8 over 3 into the equation that we have up here. So v is equal to 8 times 8 over 3 minus 3 over 2 t 8 over 3 squared. That will end up being 32 over 3 meters per second. And that will be the final answer to part A. Now for part b, find the distance of p from the origin when t is equal to 4. So we have a graph of velocity against time. The area underneath this graph would be displacement. So if we were to work out what this area here is, that will give us the distance traveled in the first 4 seconds. So we can work that out by integrating between 0 to 4, or between 0 and 4, 8t minus 3 over 2t squared. So that's the equation for the curve that we have here. So integrate this, we end up with 4t squared minus a half t cubed. So raising the power by 1, dividing by the new power, put in 4 and 0. When we put in 4, we get 32. When we put in 0, we just get 0. Take the two things away, we get 32 meters, which is our final answer for part b. And for part C, we want to find the time at which P is instantaneously at rest for when T is greater than 4 seconds. So now we're looking at the second part of this function. So V is equal to 16 minus 2T. We're looking at that function here now. That's when T is greater than 4 seconds. We're trying to find out when the particle is at rest. So that would be when V is equal to 0. So 16 minus 2T is 0. We end up with T is equal to 8 seconds. And that's part C. For part D, we want to work out the total distance traveled by P in the first 10 seconds of motion. So we have the distance traveled in the first 4 seconds. That was the 32 that we worked out. We have that distance. Now we need to work out the distance traveled in the next 6 seconds. So 
we have the equation for that part of the graph, that is v is equal to 16 minus 2t. Let's just sketch this on our velocity time graph to start with, and then we can think about how we work out distance. Remember that we can get the area under the velocity time graph to get displacement, so knowing what the full velocity time graph looks like would be useful to work out the distance travelled. We know that when v is 0, t is equal to 8, so we know that this line crosses the time axis when t is equal to 8. That'll be over here somewhere. With our old equation, our old equation was v is equal to 8t minus 3 over 2t squared. So this equation was for the, the quadratic that we had. If we put in t is equal to 4 into this, we end up with v is equal to 8. That will be the y coordinate for this point here. So that point there would be the, co the full coordinate would be 4, 8. With our new equation, v is equal to 16 minus 2t, we put in t is equal to 4, we end up with v is equal to 8 as well. So what that basically means is this second part of the graph where we're drawing the straight line, 16 minus 2t, starts at the same point where the quadratic ends. So in other words, our line, its starting coordinate, is also 4, 8. We know it goes through 8, and then we know that it ends at 10 seconds. Let's say this is 10 over here, because we're considering the first 10 seconds of motion, so we would stop when t is equal to 10. In general, we can assume that our line is continuous for a velocity time graph. If there were a break in our line, let's say we had this curve here, and then our second line started from down there somewhere. So in other words, there's a jump from 8 meters per second to 0 meters per second. Let's say that were the case. That would mean that at time 4 seconds, so over here, we have an infinite acceleration. The velocity changes from 8 to 0 in no time at all. That would mean you have infinite acceleration, which means you have infinite force, which doesn't make sense. So in general, we can just always continue our velocity time graphs. There will be no breaks in them. OK, so now we have a velocity time graph. We know the area for this first part of the graph is 32 meters. So let me highlight that. So this bit of the graph right here, we worked out the area for that to be 32 in the previous part. Now we need to work out what this area here is. And we need to work out what this area here is and then add the three things up. So for the orange area, let's have a look at that. So we know the base of this triangle, this is a triangle, the base of that triangle would be four because we start at four, we end at eight, the base is therefore four. The height of this triangle, if we look at the uh, y coordinate is eight, so this is eight. And then for the blue triangle, the base is two and the height Okay, so we need to work out what this coordinate here is. That will be when t is equal to 10 seconds. So let's put t is equal to 10 into our velocity equation. v is equal to 16 minus 2t. So when t is equal to 10, then v would be equal to 16 minus 20, which would be minus 4. So going back to this, this coordinate that we have here is 10 minus 4. So the y coordinate is 4. The height of our triangle, this length here, would be 4 and this is two. Okay, so now we have our two triangles. We can just use half base times height to work out those two areas. Let's start with the orange triangle. So half base times height, that would give us 16 meters. That's the area of that triangle. That's the distance traveled in those four seconds. For the blue triangle, the base was two and the height was four. That gives us a distance of four meters and now we can add up all of those distances. So the first part of the graph, 32 meters, and then we have the orange bit, which is 16, and then we have the blue bit, which is four, and the overall distance would then be 52 meters. That would be our final answer.